Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Dr. Aaron Douglas Dotson. I'm a resident ophthalmologist from the University of Iowa, and we want to welcome you all to our second live stream here through NMA ITV. I also have uh, my two other very distinguished guests here. I have Dr. Nanita Brown, who will be speaking a little bit later today. I wanted to say hello, Dr. Brown. Hello, happy Juneteenth, happy Father's Day. Thank you for doing this, Dr. Dotson. This is excellent. Wonderful. We're very glad to have you here, Dr. Brown. We also have my other co-moderator, Dr. Daniel LaRoche. You want to say a quick hello to everyone now? Good evening, everyone. Uh, happy Father's Day. Thank you for joining us on Juneteenth to take it to the next level. Excellent. So we have quite a bit that's uh, for us all here this evening. I want to get things started by just giving a very brief history over Juneteenth. So just give me a quick moment here. I'm going to get my slides on up. And here we go. So I first want to say, you know, welcome to everyone once again, and happy Juneteenth. Um, in order for in order for me just to give a few little ground rules for our stream today, uh, we do have a, a live chat that's also available. If there are any questions, any comments whatsoever, feel free to interact with us here in the live chat. But please be mindful. Please be as respectful as possible because I can, and I, if I need to, I can block any individual who's getting out of line. But we're very, very uh, grateful. I'm very, very glad to have you here. So we want to get things started here by just wishing you all a very happy Juneteenth. So a very brief history of Juneteenth. Uh, Juneteenth uh, is also known as Independence Day, uh, also Freedom Day, in addition to Emancipation Day. So Juneteenth is a very, very important date because it is the annual commemoration of the very end of slavery in the United States following that of the Civil War. So dating back to June 19th of 1865, the, general, uh, the Union General uh, Gordon Granger had finally arrived to Galveston, Texas, declaring the following. In accordance with a proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves. And the connection heretofore existing between them becomes that uh, of employer as well as hired labor. So Juneteenth is, it's important because this news did not arrive to Galveston, Texas until more than two and a half years later after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed um, into the United States by President Abraham Lincoln at the time. So Juneteenth, on June 17th, actually, 2021, President Joe Biden had signed Juneteenth as an official, uh, officially becoming a federal holiday. So I think that it's important that we continue to remember our history and celebrate our history each and every day. And that is my quick little presentation there. Uh, let me bring my other speakers back on and we'll get things moving. So I also want to introduce Dr. Brown, who will be our very soon speaker today, uh, discussing a few additional things here. Uh, so just a brief bio over Dr. Brown. Dr. Brown, she is an MD as well as PhD. She is a board certified ophthalmologist with specialty areas in both glaucoma as well as cataract surgery. Uh, before joining the team at the Thomas I Group within the greater Atlanta, Georgia area, Dr. Brown completed a two-year glaucoma fellowship at Duke University. Before then, she completed her ophthalmology residency at Howard University, as well as an internship at the Santa Clara Valley Medical Center. She earned her bachelor's of science degree in mathematics from Spelman College, as well as a bachelor's in science degree in electrical engineering at Georgia Tech. She then went on to complete medical school at Duke University, where she also earned her doctorate in philosophy in biomedical engineering. She is a strong member within the American Academy of Ophthalmology and a past president for the National Medical Association. Dr. Brown, we appreciate you being here this evening. Uh, I will get your slides on up here and we'll get things started with you, okay? Definitely, thank you, thank you, thank you. So um, this is a little bit of uh, information on the National Medical Association Ophthalmology section. We have an Instagram and we have a Facebook. So you, if you want to see what else is going on with, with our group, um, definitely tune in. So there is a huge eye disease burden. Um, it's projected by 2050 that there are going to be over 7 million people with 
with primary opening of glaucoma. The numbers of diabetic eye disease are also increasing as well as cataract and macular degeneration. We're gonna need at least 18% um, percent more ophthalmologists within the next couple of years. I found ophthalmology by doing a program as a medical student called Unite for Sight, where I went to Bihar, India and gave out reading glasses. Um, I got to see surgery. They had some of the best surgeons in the world doing small incision cataract surgery. So that's what brought me to ophthalmology. I was gonna be a cardiologist when I went to medical school. And now I'm able to do the volunteering myself, to do the surgery myself. In the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be going back to Haiti and doing cataract surgery and teaching residents. So we have a huge health disparity in ophthalmology. Um, even though Black people have a larger um, population of patients with glaucoma, they're less likely to have surgery. Um, they're more likely to develop diabetic retinopathy compared to their um, non-Hispanic whites. Also, they're more likely to get edema and go blind from the diabetic disease. Um, even though um, we have so much disease burden, um, we don't have enough providers. We don't have enough culturally competent providers for these patients. And we found that a strong association between the patient's race and ethnicity is a better predictor of their outcome. So specifically, if we talk about African-Americans in medicine, um, the numbers of black males is actually worse than it was in 1978. If we speak specifically in ophthalmology, the numbers are even lower. So over the years, we've had more, more or less a flat line in our workforce of African-American MDs. Um, if we look specifically at ophthalmologists, there are only about 400 Black ophthalmologists in the United States right now. And those numbers continue to decline because as the workforce gets older, we're not replacing people as they're retiring or suffering from burnout all of these things that um, disproportionately affect Black ophthalmologists. So what do we do? The National Medical Association, um, we have an organization, a section within the um, National Medical Association, which is specifically for ophthalmologists, people who are interested in serving underserved communities, people who are interested in um, bridging this diversity gap. So this is us in Hawaii every year. We invite medical students, residents, fellows, and practicing ophthalmologists to come for a CME. Um, specifically, we focus on health disparities, and we have a lot of different discussions on new technology and um, new designs and um, better ways to treat our patients. So our biggest goal is to bridge this gap. So you can see um, the number of ophthalmologists um, across the nation. The majority are male, the majority are white, um, and black ophthalmologists, Latino ophthalmologists has been a flat line since 2005. So we really want to be able to bridge that gap and have more practicing ophthalmologists. So, What's complicated about ophthalmology is that we have a match program. So students come in and they have to apply early to become an ophthalmologist. Most students get their first, second, or third choice. There are about 500 spots and 120 programs throughout the United States. And the biggest challenge right now is that the step score, the exam you have to take, you have to do really well. Um, and in 2020, we only had about 15 students match into ophthalmology. So once again, we're not replacing our workforce. So the National Medical Association has a program called the RAB Venable Research Program. The applications are due around March and they're for students all the way from undergraduates up to fellows. You can come and present your research. You can come and observe our meeting. Um, the other program that has been developed by the American Academy of Ophthalmology is the MOM program. Um, this is for undergraduate students all the way up to second year medical students, and they're able to attend national conferences and have mentorship. 
as a medical student, you can also do away rotations in ophthalmology where you get fully supported for your housing, um, transportation. Um, the National Medical Associ Association has also started a scholarship at Howard University Medical School um, for students named after um, Vanessa Geiken, who was a prominent member of our organization. And lastly, due to the work of Dr. LaRoche, who you'll hear from later, we also have the McDonough Medical Student Scholarship for those going into ophthalmology or ENT. For people who are a little earlier in their career, um, there are programs such as the Unite for Sight, which um, takes high school students all the way up to retired folks to Ghana, India, or Honduras. Also locally, if you would like to volunteer, the Student Sight Savers is on every college campus or you can start your own um, and you go out and do eye screenings for glaucoma. And lastly, the Student National Medical Association, which is kind of like the medical student organization for um, black students and students of color, they have high school programs and college programs to try and increase diversity within all of the different fields of medicine. Thank you. Excellent, thank you so much, Dr. Brown. I really do appreciate uh, you coming on today and giving your expertise. Uh, I can personally say that, you know, I was a recipient of the uh, Dr. David uh, McDonough Scholarship. I was also a participant within Rab Venable. Uh, without Rab Venable, I would not be here today as an ophthalmology resident. So we are actively looking for more very passionate people wanting to go into this great specialty. I'm in the midst of residency right now. You know, residency is tough no matter where it is that you go, but I can tell you right now i'm having quite a blast i'm having a real fun time uh, in comparison to many other specialties so definitely choose ophthalmology absolutely consider it so thank you so much once again wonderful so our next speaker here we have is dr daniel laroche uh, dr laroche would you uh, care to just introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit more about what you'll be talking with us here this evening sure well, my name is dr daniel laroche let me back this slide up over here I'm a board certified ophthalmologist practicing in New York City, glaucoma specialist, went to college at New York University, uh, medical school at Cornell University Medical College, internship at Montefiore Hospital in the Bronx, ophthalmology residency at Howard University, glaucoma fellowship uh, at New York Eye and Ear Infirmary, and now I'm the president of Advanced Eye Care of New York with offices in Harlem and Southeast Queens in New York. Uh, excellent job, Dr. Brown. Thank you so much. Excellent job, Aaron, as well. Thank you. Uh, today, I'm just going to talk about the need for more Black doctors, nurses, scientists, and engineers, but advice that what families can give to students and children to, to move along. Um, my presentation is my reflections and how I teach people. Uh, it's not affiliated with the National Medical Association, and it's my thoughts and my uh, approach in, in teaching uh, the youth. Uh, we have a global shortage of black health professionals, doctors, nurses, scientists, medical engineers, and allied health professionals. And the global shortage is in hotspots, particularly in black cities in the United States, the Caribbean, South America, Brazil, and Africa, cities throughout Africa. So how do you ensure that your child becomes successful? Well, one, you want to try to live in a good neighborhood with an excellent school district that has a good track record. Uh, good neighborhoods have more resources financially that they support better school districts in that respect. Make sure you're not, your child is not placed in special ed or remedial classes, nor diagnosed with ADHD or placed on medications. That could interfere with their ability to be successful. Always give supplemental reading in addition to schoolwork to learn Black and African history, since this is not often taught in school. Always give supplemental science and math homework and ensure your child is disciplined. Because if your child is not disciplined and not behaved at school, they will use that to give violations to your kid and sometimes kick your children out of school, okay? And they're very prejudiced when they do that, particularly in the United States. And the 42 laws of Ma'at are uh, excellent wisdom teaching to help teach discipline and character. Education has been very important in our communities historically from thousands of years ago. The Sebae, there was a certain way that the ancient African education system was implemented. The most important subjects taught at schools were mathematics, reading, 
writing, arithmetic, geometry, geography, astronomy, medicine, and moral instruction. And all of these subjects are a very important part of African society. As you can see, the Sebaite and the Medonetta teaching, the gateway, the doorway, instruction. In chapter 125 of the Papyrus of Ani, you have the divine principles of Ma'at. And these are important principles to have more, a moral compass and moral instruct for children. And this is the African tradition. And it goes as follows. I've not committed sin. I've not committed robbery with violence. I've not stolen. I've not slain men or children. I've not stolen food. I've not swindled offerings. I've not stolen. I've not told lies. I've not carried away food. I have not cursed. I have not closed my ears to the truth. I have not committed adultery. I have not made anyone cry. I have not felt sorrow without reason. I have not assaulted anyone. I am not deceitful. I have not stolen anyone's land. I have not been an eavesdropper. I have not falsely accused anyone. I have not been angry without reason. I have not seduced anyone's wife. I have not polluted myself. I have not terrorized anyone. I have not disobeyed the law. I have not been exclusively angry. I have not cursed. I've not behaved with violence. I've not caused disruption of the peace. I've not acted hastily without thought. I've not overstepped my boundaries of concern. I've not exaggerated my words when speaking. I've not worked evil. I've not used evil thoughts, words, or deeds. I've not polluted the water. I've not spoken angrily or arrogantly. I've not cursed anyone in thought, words, or deeds. I've not placed myself on a pedestal. I've not stolen. I've not stolen or disrespected the deceased. I've not taken away food from a child, I've not acted with insolence, and I've not destroyed property. This was represented by a woman with an ankh and a feather on her head. Living in these principles of Ma'at, having excellent character, living in truth, righteousness, justice, order, balance, harmony, and reciprocity is key to have excellent character to be a great physician, a great person in whatever specialty that you do. This is a picture of the uh, son of the Pharaoh Shabaka, uh, the high priest of Ramun dated back 700 BCE wearing an ankh around his neck. Always have the kids walk around with a book to read throughout the day. This is a book I wrote, How to Be a Successful Young Black Man, Idea, The Benin Kingdom, Imhotep, Ancient Kemet. There's a variety of books that are out there, but always have them reading, reading and building their brain. Just like we exercise physically, reading is exercise for the brain. Students in grade eight or nine who want to enroll in the New York City specialized high schools must take a specialized high school test. These specialized high school tests run in different formats across the country. In New York City, where I am, the specialized high schools are the Bronx High School of Science, Brooklyn Tech, the High School for Math and Science and Engineering City College, the High School for American Studies at Lehman College, Queens High School for Sciences at York College and Staten Island Technical High School. There are test prep books you have to take. You've got to get these test prep books to prepare the kids for the test prep, okay? Other groups are doing that and we're not doing as well in the test prep. In New York City, we're 30% African-American. When we get to these specialized high schools, the numbers go down to 5% admissions because we're not doing as well on the test prep and academics. We have to overcome that. How do you prepare the child for this test? Well, once again, reading is very important. The test prep books and courses are important. Always do supplemental homework. Have a safe and quiet space for your child to study and be able to sleep. Have your child follow their passion with excellence, consistency, and persistency. In grades 9 through 12, you have the Regents examination. And once again, that's another level of test prep, okay? Avoid special education classes. There's also the PSAT and the SAT. Once again, test prep. These are the Regents test prep books you have to get, okay? English, algebra, living environment, algebra two, biology. There's a lot of test prep that you have to prepare because it keeps on going. Grades 11 through 12, have your child try to take advanced placement classes. These are college level classes that can be applied to colleges and shows that colleges that your child can handle a college level coursework. And once again, there's AP test prep, world history, um, uh, US history, human geography, AP physics, and AP English and so on. During the summers of grade 11 to 12, have your children get summer job opportunities to get to learn how to work, learn how to make money, learn how to dress for success, and also to volunteer in the areas that they want to go in, volunteering at the hospital, at doctor's office, at clinics, or whatever space that they want to learn. Have them learn uh, to volunteer and be exposed to that and see what they're uh, to be inspired. When you go to college, try to get into the best college you can at an affordable price. 
Try to get scholarships. Do not go into too much debt going into college. Continue to study hard. Participate in some of work-related programs to pursue your goals and interests. Once again, there's more test prep. Study for the MCATs if you're interested in medicine, the ACT, or if you're going to other professional schools, do those test prep. These are MCAT test books that can range from $100 to $300 because uh, it's all very important for the medical school admissions process. These are ACT test prep books that you're going to have to do. Very important to prepare for the next level. Along the way, learn about African history, Black medical history. There are books like Blacks in Science by Avram Van Sertema that came before Columbus, Egypt, the Child of Africa, uh, many different books, Sheikh Ante Diop, the African Origin of Civilization. These are important so you can learn our history. Also find a pipeline network. Dr. Brown mentioned the Student National Medical Association, www.snma.org. They have a high school um, uh, H-PREP program and a college MAPS program. These are pipeline programs where you can see students that look like yourself at a higher level uh, to get the mentoring that you need to take it to the next level. And um, these are images from the SNMA H-PREP and MAPS program. And then it's also important to know our history, okay? Um, the first author of the first book was Patah Hotep, who wrote the Maxims of Patah Hotep over 5,000 years ago. I remember when I was in school, some, some of the black kids would say, well, why are you trying to be white by studying? I mean, we're not trying to be white by studying. We, we were the founders of writing, the Medunetta. We were the founders of language. We were the founders of publishing books. Tahotep wrote the first book. Imhotep was the first physician who wrote the first medical textbook. Iri, the Stella Iri, was the first ophthalmologist back in ancient Egypt. The Book of Kagemi, the silent man who is modest, calm, and practices self-control, is seen as the most virtuous. The teachings of Amenemo, to improve the quality of inwardness. Those with the right thinking and the right action will find the reward and worldly success. This is a source of the Hebrew wisdom of Proverbs. The Sebai, African wisdom text, including the uh, text of Kagegmi, the text of Patahotep, the text of Merikari. These are all ancient African wisdom texts that uh, we should fam be familiar with and understand this academic history that we have. With respect to technology and paper, the word paper comes from papyrus. We made paper from papyrus along the Nile Valley to help publish, writing, libraries. All of that came from the Nile Valley. It's an important part of our history. And we need more people in technology and today like our ancestors. The Tepa Seb, noted by Professor Obenga, the correct method. The necessity for the correct method to be used in directing human intelligence and its effort to understand reality. The method envisions obviously the science and mathematics. And for the ancient African Egyptians, the concept of mathematics required the abstract concept, which noted a correct method. So we have to do everything in a correct method and methodology, methodologically. Excellence, Erker, the quality of being outstanding or extremely good. We must teach children to strive for excellence and to approach the school in anything that they do. Erker, wealth, virtue, excellence, efficiency. This is the writing in the Medunetta. The arts are very important, okay? We develop string arts. Using your hands, both hands for musical industry, building the left side of the brain, the right side of the brain, using your auditory, all of these things, the arts are very, very important. I uh, don't, be, don't feel like you have to be limited in what you're doing. I even uh, was able to uh, publish this song, Check Your Eye Pressure, to help educate the community about the importance of getting their eyes checked uh, for cataract and glaucoma. And we even did a music video to, uh, to do that. So if you have other musical talents, don't be afraid to use that and express that. We need more arts that reflect positive energy, positive images, positive culture. We need to reject arts that degrade our culture. And we must teach others the beauty of the African origin of the arts. With respect to architecture, the pyramids are the best example of ancient African architecture. But what is less known is that an African family built these great structures. Senefru built three pyramids, the bent one, which wasn't successful, the median, which wasn't as successful, but then the red was the first perfect triangular pyramid. His son Khufu built the great pyramid of Giza. His Khufu son Khafre built the second largest pyramid of Giza. And Kafre Semenkari built the third pyramid of Giza. This is four generations of an African family that built a monumental structure that lasted thousands of years. Okay. And that's the importance of family and building. I don't want to leave the ladies out. Hatshepsut was a queen who built this temple. Okay. Not only was she was a queen, but she was a queen who was a king. 
and had a very powerful uh, leadership in her dynasty in ancient Kemet. We need more architects like our ancestors. With respect to mathematics, we invented mathematics. This is a stella from Neferibet. And you can see over here, this symbol is a thousand. This one's 100. These are individuals numbers. And we invented mathematics. We need more mathematicians like our ancestors. Medicine was started in Africa. This is at the temple of Kom Ombo in the Nile Valley. And you can see all these uh, medical instruments that are used over here. And some of them are still we use today that are similar to this over here. And so, and many women were physicians back then as well. We need more medical doctors and health professionals. There is warfare that affects the training of the next generation of black students not getting to elite high schools. It is known in many high schools that, the, that black students are not doing as well on standardized testing. The reason for that is because of the wealth gap. The, uh, the white population has a 10 time greater income than the black population and they can afford more test prep. And that's what's causing the gap. It's not because of intelligence. There's no correlation between how well you're doing the test and how good of a surgeon or a doctor you're going to be. So we have to address that. I wrote this article for the sake of racial justice and equity, time to eliminate standardized testing. You can look that up and read more about it for more details on that. It's also very important that we have culture, ownership, history, law, politics, economics, and military. Ownership is very important. This is in the Meduneta, to own, to own your property, okay, to be effective, to be skilled. Politics is very important because you have to have control of your politics so you can have the resources to govern the land. This is in the Meduneta. Military, defending ourselves, our family, and our society. In the Meduneta, this is the triliteral aha, two arms holding a mason and shield, to fight, to guard, to protect. It's very important to maintain a healthy diet, exercise, meditation. Knowledge itself will help to address mental illness, restore black society, reduce psychological difficulty, reduce violence and criminal injustices, reduce health and financial inequalities in society, and improve character and excellence in medicine and the allied health professions. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. LaRose. We really appreciate you and, um, you know, providing this presentation and giving your expertise as well. I'll also bring Dr. Brown back on. Excellent. So, you know, my, my sincerest apologies if I didn't have the, the chat uh, available within the YouTube live stream. Uh, by all means, feel free to post any uh, comments or any questions at all once this is officially posted to YouTube for you all to view. Um, if there are any other additional topics that you want for anime ophthalmology to cover, feel free to reach out to us directly or post them within our YouTube comment section or even our Facebook live comment section. Uh, I really appreciate the both of you being here today and providing your two presentations. Uh, any any questions that you two may have or any additional comments that you two may have? Do we have the chat? The chat's not on? So my chat, unfortunately, within YouTube at this moment, uh, it, it's not currently available. I tried uh, getting it to be available as you were giving your presentation, but right now that's that's okay. That's okay. But any questions or comments that come to your mind, Dr. LaRose, or even Dr. Brown? I just want to say hello to my parents who are on the call and happy Father's Day to my dad. As I listened to your presentation, Dr. Roach, my father was a um, professor and my mother was in the medical field. And so a lot of the hurdles that kids have to go through, um, I was really not aware of that until I got into college and then I got into medical school. And, you know, it really is so important for the parents to be involved and to actively um, find mentorship for their children. Um, and, you know, we're just blessed and highly favored. Hands down. Yeah. I mean, even for myself, I feel like most people who are of color in medicine, we all have some similar story of someone who believed in us to help get us into medicine. 
Uh, my person was Dr. Gilbert. He was my mom's internal medicine physician. When I was a little kid, I used to be super nosy, ask every single question under the sun. And he, he realized that he was like, well, you know, Aaron, since you have so many questions, why don't you come and shadow with me? And I feel like it's experiences like that's where it just takes one person to believe in you, to be that mentor, to get you from point A to point B. I'm also extremely appreciative of my parents for um, believing in me and helping me to become a physician too. Neither of them are physicians, uh, but they they went out of their way to see me through this entire process. Yeah, my dad was a physician and my mom was a nurse, so I was always very exposed to the uh, field of medicine. So I had some you know, inside information there that was very helpful uh, as I fell in love with the profession and decided to pursue it. Um, so, but that's not, that's not to say I know a lot of my friends who didn't have parents in medicine. And the thing is, is just, you know, immerse yourself. Uh, if, you, if this is of interest to you, no matter what it is, immerse yourself into that space. Okay. Be a volunteerism, uh, working, uh, you know, identify someone that can mentor you. Um, I mentor a lot of students in my office. I have people come watch me. We've created this platform here so that um, with the NMA ITV, we're going to be bringing you medical information from people that look like you in that respect. So I really do apologize to those of you who are watching because we do like to make this interactive with the chat and have a stream yard so that people can come up. Are we able to, we can't do stream yard with that without the chat also? Is that how it works, Aaron? Uh, it's it's a little bit different. StreamYard is kind of like our, our centralized location that's then sent to different accounts and such. Um, uh, but for this stream right now, we may not be able to do like a live interactive chat at the moment, but um, that's that's okay for this time. We'll be sure okay. to have it available during our next week. Okay, yeah. So we'll do that. So we apologize. I just want to apologize because I did invite some people and I thought they'd be able to come on in that respect. So my apologies. But um, thank you, Dr. Brown. That was an excellent talk. Um, and I think, you know, I was able to get the information from my perspective as well for the students to try to give some concrete uh, methodology and uh, information uh, in that respect. Uh, we'll be doing more shows like this in the future. Uh, if you have uh, any other topics or questions uh, when this is posted, please put it in the chat. We'll go back to it to be able to answer questions uh, in that respect uh, and, uh, and look out for future episodes. Please subscribe to the channel. Uh, please like the channel. Uh, please share it with other student groups, other teacher groups, uh, so that uh, students can see this. I cannot bring students into the operating room, okay? Uh, when I started bringing students in the happy room, they just changed the policy. Say, oh, no, no, you can't bring, like, you know, uh, college students and medical students into the operating room. So, so this is going to be our way of bringing you the information, uh, bringing you animated surgical information, uh, different things that we do. We're going to push, post short videos. Uh, so we just started this recently, but we're going to continue to give information to the general public uh, and be a resource for patients, uh, students uh, that want to go into medicine in the community. Excellent. Well, thank you so much once again, Dr. LaRoche, as well as Dr. Brown. I'm very appreciative of your time. And thank you so much to all of our guests who tuned in this evening and to those who will be watching this stream a little bit later on. Uh, we are, once again, the National Medical Association Ophthalmology Section, and this is NMAI-TV. Thank you so much again, and we'll see you next time around. Thanks.